and welcome to this review of my AT&T 56K 460 ACW keyboard. I've been looking forward to showing you this one so much. To avoid confusion with another AT&T 56K keyboard I own, which uses AT&T buckling springs, I call this one the MagSep board on account of its unique switch design that I showed in a teardown video earlier this week. Go check it out if you haven't yet. The switches are AT&T Magnetic Separation, which are a clicky design in which the clicker and tactile element is a magnet. Yes, you heard that right. But we'll get to that in a bit. Let's first look at the board itself. I bought this keyboard for $40 through Ben, aka NG Coder, who also made the calculator module for my FK9000 keyboard, and who also regularly proxies for me. He also made a converter for the keyboard, as it came with a terminal jack and some weird protocol, so many thanks, as always, to this great man for making this review possible. It wasn't exactly clean, and the contamination shield, which is this thin mat of black rubbery material, was torn in many places and so dirty that it really wasn't salvageable anymore, so I just tore it off. But it's cleaned up really nicely, I think. One thing I'll say is that it's rather large. As a matter of fact, at 54 and a half centimeters long, I dare say it's actually fucking huge! Anyway, enough about my penis, the keyboard weighs in at over 2.3 kilos, so it's quite a heavyweight. In fact, you can easily bash someone's fucking head in with it. This is probably because of the thick plastic case and massive metal mounting plate, and even partly due to the switches themselves, which are pretty heavy, weighing in at 4 grams each, so almost half a kilo for 122 switches. That's about the same weight as this entire Dell L100 series poop shite just in switches. Impressive. Compare that to a Cherry MX switch, for example, at only 1.5 grams, and you can tell there's a considerable difference. So in terms of build quality, it's pretty outstanding, and the keycaps are very nice as well. They're made out of thick PBT, and the legends are dice-up, with a few double dice-up ones even. Or, at least, I think they're dice-up, because they look dice-up, but all the caps are covered with very tenacious stickers, as you can see on this one, where it's gotten a bit dirty. Now, either these stickers are just there for texture, or they also include the legends, in which case they're not very good for pad-printed legends, which are normally quite sharp, while these look slightly fuzzy, like dice-up ones. Unlike pad printing, where it's just the lettering that's covered by the sticker, in this case it's the entire cap, and the cover is pretty thick as well. Very strange. I used to have a full set, but as you can see, two of them are missing. I seem to have lost them somehow. This is unfortunate, because they use a unique inverse cross mount that's unlike any other caps I have, including Futaba, so I wouldn't be able to replace these. Thankfully, at least the sliders are broad and flat, so they're almost like little keycaps. The back of the keyboard has a whole bank of dip switches, eight of them to be exact. It was probably for selecting protocols or changing the layout or something, but their precise function isn't known to me. I just left them as they were. Here's the model sticker of the keyboard showing it was made by, or for, AT&T Teletype from Skokie, Illinois. And there's this curious dollar sign that seems a bit out of place on the model sticker. Don't know what that's all about. Now one thing it's got that's very typical for AT&T keyboards is the design of the feet, which is also extremely esoteric. So instead of having some simple flip-out pieces of plastic, it's got these little hook-shaped feet on crenellated stalks, and they're held under tension by a spring inside the case. Now what happens is that you can adjust the feet by hooking it by the crenellations into the case at the height you desire, which is cool because that allows you to pick from multiple angles. Unfortunately, I found that if you use them, the keyboard becomes very unstable, more so than it normally already is, because one of the rubber pads is missing. So while it's cool, I don't think it's very practical. The converter Ben rigged up is this nice black box thing with a bit of a vintage theme and ticker tape, and it works really well. It made something very similar for an old NMB terminal I reviewed a while ago, too. So, onto the mysterious AT&T magnetic separation switches. The name might be a bit misleading, but it basically means that when you're pressing a key, you're separating a magnet from an anchor element, in this case a steel ring, and the separation of these two elements is what causes the tactile event and the clicky noise. It's an ingenious mechanism for generating a click, as it's so simple, and moreover, it doesn't require any rubbing motion, unlike the vast majority of title elements, such as the Cherry MX Notch or Alps Leaf Spring. So it's a contactless clicker, which is really cool. 
As for the sensing, it works with foam and foil pads underneath the slider, which is basically a sponge with a bit of metal on the end. But, compared to other foam and foil switches, you don't really feel the mushiness or spongy feeling of the foam a lot, because the slider is a two-part design with a coil spring that communicates the two parts. So because you don't press on the foam directly with the slider, instead the increase in resistance during the over-travel comes mainly from the coil spring rather than the foam. Again, an ingenious solution. Also, it probably helps that the foam pad used on these switches is extremely thin. The combination of non-sponginess as well as a moderate amount of smoothness, a side benefit from having a non-contact based clicker, yields a switch with a very unique feel and I quite like it. A bit stiff maybe and the click happens very deep down but not too bad overall. And it's got a very cool ultra thunky clicky noise as well, listen to this. Apart from the rather strange but overall pretty decent key feel, the fact that it's a foam and foil board yields all the benefits of a capacitive switch as well. It has inherent end key rollover as well as a very long lifetime, presumably at least a hundred million cycles per switch or possibly many more. So really what's not to like here? Well, actually, there's one thing that's a bit of a problem. It uses very ineffective stabilizers. And as usual, the key most affected by this is the right shift. By the way, pro tip, if you want to see how well a stabilizer works, always look at the right shift. This one binds very badly. If you press it on the left edge, the switch is on the right, it barely goes down at all. The single unit switches bind slightly too. It's not too bad, but it is noticeable if you pay attention to it. Considering how dirty it was when I got it, I think that could probably be fixed with some lubricant though. Now, on one hand, you don't need to desolder these switches to open them, but on the other hand, the slider is quite difficult to remove, and because of the magnet, replacing the springs can be a bit fiddly, so doing this may take some effort. Nonetheless, it may well be worth the time because, in my opinion, this mechanism almost defines what tactility is about. It builds a pressure until the plunger literally falls out from under your fingers. So, from a technical perspective, it's just about the purest form of tactility that you can get. And it's not even overbearing or anything, it's just a somewhat mild but extremely sharp little tactile bump. It's lovely. Note that the setup of the switches does come with a rather noticeable hysteresis. It might take some getting used to. Hysteresis is a desirable thing in most switch designs, but sometimes an excessive amount of it can get in the way when you're playing games where quickly tapping keys is an important part of the gameplay. Now, I should mention that I was able to play games on this just fine, but I do think that for some of the more demanding games at high level, this would present a problem. On a side note, just a loose switch like this is one of the absolute best fidget gadgets I've ever seen. I could click this thing all day long, it's super satisfying, and the sound is really cool too. I used this keyboard with one of the switches taken out of it for the entirety of the testing period, mostly to fuck around with it and study the design, but thankfully you can still use the key even when the key is removed. Being capacitive, you can just touch the CapSense pads with your finger and it'll register. This is a useful trick to determine whether a capacitive PCB is still working properly, by the way. It uses an AT&T layout, which includes the usual 24 F keys at the top, actually they're PF keys, but anyway, plus 12 weird commands on the left, with Alt slash Control buttons down here. It also has the Enter button here, separate from the Return key, which again was a fairly common thing on terminals. This one was probably Unix based. Also a fairly standard cross-nav with a home key in the middle, and keys marked with all the symbols for Insert and Delete, and a reasonably standard numpad, apart from the addition of a tab key, as well as a single unit space bar in the numpad? I mean, is it technically still even a space bar when it's tiny like this? Anyway, this keyboard is fantastically interesting, such a cool design for a Switch. I hope at some point they'll bring something like this back, because it has great potential. I might lube the Switches one day to get rid of the slightly bindy feel the keys have, because it's a lot of fun to use, and it's extremely well built to boot. Very nice keyboard overall. That's it for this review, thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.